Okay, hi, this is Elliot Fishman. And my phone is ringing because Lily's telling me whenever you're ready, and I'm ready. I didn't comb my hair, it's not really that ready, but uh, all right, let me just, get some minor adjustments there. Um, hello, I, I'm from, calling from, uh, from work, and I um, hope everybody's doing well. It's September, it's uh, hard to imagine it gets, uh, it's dark in the morning, it's getting dark earlier every day, like 6.30 is sunset here. Um, Baltimore, things are well, about 80 degrees, 70 degrees, a lot of rain. Uh, we wish there was a lot of rain on the West Coast. We have friends in California. I've seen the pictures like in San Francisco with the orange sky, it kind of looks like apocalypse. So we hope all of our friends are safe. I mean, uh, you can argue about many things, but as you learn from the pandemic, you don't mess around with mother nature. So whether it's the global warming and the dryness and the incredible number of fires caused by lightning or stupidity of people having reveals and doing fireworks. I don't know what you're thinking. So all of that um, really is is problematic uh, and we hope everybody is safe. Um, so this talk today is on, uh, is on uh, small bowel. I just want to show you that it's hard, how strange the times are. And look at this. I got a new container of Lysol wipes. None of you ever bought Lysol wipes, nor were you concerned about Lysol wipes. But now you got to come in your office and you got to wipe everything down. So let me just wipe things down. Uh, it's amazing. I got a, I got an email that um, that the Lysol wipes are available at Walmart or something. So if I would ever go to Walmart, I probably would would buy some wipes. But um, things are, are are indeed strange. But the good news is business is back to normal. Uh, we um, literally uh, our volumes are essentially identical to a year ago so that part's good and i know most people i speak to is good radiology is really changing today uh i read in the paper that you know mednex which is a big company that has anesthesiology and pediatrics and board radiology vrad specifically a number of years ago a few months ago decided and they said not related to covid that they wouldn't get rid of uh, radiology let it stand on its own because it just wasn't what their experience was, wasn't their game plan. They had some really good groups, a lot of good radiologists. Baptist Hospital was part of them. But today it was announced that Radiology Partners, which is the group Jay Bronner was head of out of California, bought them for $880 million. Now, Rad Partners, I think, was about 1,600 radiologists. If, I, if I'm correct, um, uh, Mednex is about 800 radiologists. So that means they have about 2,500, 2,600 radiologists in the group. Talk about a super group. There's only like 30,000 radiologists in the U.S. And these are all practicing radiologists who actually read films. Uh, not a bunch of slackers who are just doing administrative work, perhaps. Which means that group has more than 10% of the working radiologists, which is a quite, quite amazing and you go back and you say a group that was 10 people used to be considered really, really large. So uh, um, times have changed. Um, in terms of things to, on, on CT, we are, again, we updated a bunch of apps recently. We're updating a bunch of cases. I know our guys uh, and our reach of CT is us, which I get the reports on, continues to grow. We have four people saying hello. Uh, Cassandra from Jayhawk, the outpatient center, about 300 feet away from me. And then John Biakina, who's one of our senior techs, who I saw the other day, but who's home today, Mace Chapel, is outside of town. And then someone in Cancun, and that's a good place to be now, probably, or in India, which is probably super hot. Probably Cancun is super hot as well. But um, so we do kind of cover the globe, which is kind of cool. And um, this time I'm going to speak about small bowel. And uh, small bowel is something that interests me. There's a couple of new talks coming along about inflammatory bowel disease as well as on malignancies. And one of the things CT has always been good on, and I think I wrote one of my earliest articles was on CT of Crohn's disease, how you could uh, change management of patients by using CT. And that same thing is true today. In terms of doing small bowel, I think one of the most common areas where people miss things, overcall things, undercall, is in the small bowel. Anybody can see a 10 centimeter lymphoma, but it's the one centimeter lesions that are tricky. We pick up more and more small bowel tumors that are small, GIST and carcinoid are two good examples, in part because we do really good protocols with fast injection and acquisition. We also more and more look at the small bowel as part of GI bleeding, 
We do lots of GI bleeding studies, and in this era of COVID, we seem to see more patients with GI bleeding. It's interesting, I've seen more patients with COVID with GI bleeding. Okay, that's one thing because of all the um, hypercoagulability states that relate to COVID. But in this period of six months, I've seen more COVID negative patients, either post-op complications or just de novo bleeding from tumors, vasculitis, you name it. So I'm not sure if it's just coincidence or the sicker patients come to the hospital and that's, and that's who we end up seeing. So in terms of small bowel, the key thing to me is the extension of the small bowel and then enhancement. So what you want to use is you want to use water. You can use volumen. Volumen creates essentially uh, diarrhea in the bowel, which distends the bowel. Volumen, however, is tolerated by a lot of patients relatively poorly. It's expensive. Um, its advantage, of course, is that it brings fluid into the bowel, and in a normal non-obstructed bowel, no matter how much water you drink, it gets relatively quickly absorbed. But surely for the proximal aspects of bowel, and surely if there's any obstruction narrowing the natural content of bowel, the fluid really shows you those transitions. So we like water, and so things like duodenum, stomach, duodenum, jejunum, and down, water distension is critical, and then IV contrast. So for IV contrast, we want to have arterial and venous injection. Arterial injection is great because a lot of small bowel tumors are small and they're vascular. Think carcinoid, think just tumor. You're going to miss them if you don't have a arterial face imaging. Sometimes we see them arterial and venous. Most of the time it's arterial better than venous, but many times it's arterial only. And that's particularly true in small lesions and the lesions which don't cause any bowel obstruction. Now we also know that in terms of um, GI bleeding, you need two phases. I've spoken about this before. Uh, we don't do non-contrast because if you have a bleed, it changes between arterial and venous. And many bleeds are subtle arterial, but they're really easy to see venous. Other beads, bleeds are better seen arterial than venous. Some are equally well seen in both. The other thing is that if a bleed changes from arterial to venous substantially, where there's a lot more blood in the venous phase, which is always going to be the case, it's never the reverse, um, those are the patients who will really benefit from angiography and also when you do angio, the likelihood of the angio being positive is much higher. Also by identifying the site of bleeding, we can basically with CT angiography figure out what vessels involve. So if the patient gets an angiogram two hours later and there's no bleeding, which happens all the time, the really good angiographers will go in and embolize the vessel that they know supply the area of bleeding. So there won't be a situation where you take the patient off the table and two days later they re-bleed. So that indeed becomes very, very important as well. When we look at bowel, we look at three major categories. One I would say is tumors. So the small bowel tumors, commonly obstructing adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, metastasis, gist tumors, carcinoid tumors. Of course, there's a whole range of other things. We then think about inflammatory disease. So the first thing I think about is Crohn's disease. And the other big one is ischemic bowel. We see lots of patients with abdominal pain, older patients. One of the things you worry about, particularly with elevated lactic acid levels, is ischemic bowel. We look at the celiac, we look at the SMA, we look at its branching, we look at the feeding of vessels, the size of the vessels, the number of vessels, the opacification of the vessels. We look at all of that. We look at the vascular map, of course, as well. We look for enhancement. An important thing with ischemia is early on, there may be hyperemia, and later on, there may be hypo. Uh, uh, enhancement. So ischemic bowel early on very vascular increased flow later on decreased flow and it's not enhancing well so if you see that hyper enhancement you really notice it sometimes hypo is less and you know kind of appreciated perhaps but it's a very very important finding. So when we talk about bowel those are two categories. The third category I'll speak about is infectious. I showed a case yesterday at a conference of an HIV patient who had really ugly large bowel and small bowel, and it was CMV enteritis. I showed a case last week of really thick and small bowel folds that was sprue in the patient's jejunum. I also showed a case with really impressive dilated villi, which could have been sprue, I guess, but it was just two big folds, so it wasn't going to be sprue. It was primary lymphangiectasia. So recognizing whether the bowel is dilated or it's narrowed, whether the folds are thickened or flattened, whether it's too much enhancement or too little enhancement. Those are all things we need to look at. Axials are good. I would say if I have one set of images, I'm going with coronal 
Sagittals are good for looking at the origin of celiac and SMA. I don't think they're that helpful otherwise, but the coronals are great because transitions of bowel, be able to follow long lengths of bowel become very important. Reconstructions, MIP is really good for looking at a vascular arcade, and volume rendering is very good for looking at a vascular arcade and looking at bowel at the same time. And again, interactively looking at those images becomes very, very important in that regard. So I'm particularly uh, important to me is doing the mapping in that region. As I mentioned, infectious inflammatory disease depends on your population. We are seeing a lot more infection. We always have an HIV and AIDS, MAI, thickened bowel loops, but lots of mesenteric nodes, which are often low density, CMV, distal small bowel, shigellosis, distal small bowel, Bechet's disease is not quite infectious, in the ileum. So you can go on and on and really think about the different disease processes and put them in categories. The other category I need to throw in there is under miscellaneous or maybe it's iatrogenic. We see lots of patients who get chemotherapy who have chemotherapy-induced enteritis, particularly pancreatic cancer, multiple high-dose chemotherapies. Interestingly, they, sometimes patients have zero symptoms and really bad-looking bowel. It can perforate, but it's really thickened edematous bowel. You may be thinking about enteritis, ischemia, infection, but it's from chemotherapy. We also know that if you do radiation therapy and the port's wide enough, and depending what you're covering, you can get radiation enteritis. We wrote that article with Avazinarac like a thousand years ago, uh, but that's an important thing also. And then finally, there are certain cases, Mike Federley used to show these cases of ACE inhibitors we have really edematous bowel. It looks like an ischemic process, but it's a patient with severe abdominal pain who's just been put on ACE inhibitors. So that's something also to consider. So I have shown cases in conference which basically look at that point where they, um, you don't think about it. You know, you're going down the barrel of ischemia, which doesn't make sense. The patient's 40, you're thinking about Crohn's, but it really doesn't look like Crohn's. You're thinking about infection, you're thinking about tumor. Then you gotta say, aha, what about iatrogenic chemotherapy, ACE inhibitors, the two big ones. So that becomes very, very important to look at. Now in terms of bowel tumors, we look at enhancement patterns. Very vascular, you gotta think about GIST and carcinoid. Carcinoids more common are intraluminal and have a mass in the mesentery, more common distally than proximally, though there is a range of carcinoids in the duodenum. GIST tumors tend to be exophytic, small, often incidental, but can be very large. The small ones are the ones that are very vascular and likely to bleed. The larger ones are less vascular and are likely to perforate or obstruct and occasionally will bleed as well. But the smaller ones in my experience are really the ones that bother me in terms of bleeding. So we look at that and you think about other tumors, metastasis, renal cell vascular metastasis, uh, melanoma, metastasis, multiple solid masses, intersusceptic. We talk about intersusceptions, which can be the Crohn's disease, which can be iatrogenic, particularly jejunum, but you gotta be thinking about metastatic disease, and melanoma is a really good one. So I also, as I mentioned, vascular, we think about renal cell, look very carefully. There are other tumors, uh, breast cancer, mets, kind of sclerosing mets down to the ileum is probably more classic. Um, I mentioned renal cell being vascular. Uh, almost anything can metastasize to bowel, and as people live longer, it'll probably be more common. But breast, melanoma, those are the ones that I really think about more than anything else. Maybe lung cancer pushes into that realm of things. When we talk about uh, METS to, to uh, bowel, I should say when I talk about like melanoma, I'm talking about solitary METS or multiple METS to the bowel, wall, or lumen. We also have direct extension by tumor. So uh, best example would be pancreatic cancer where the tumor in the head grows into duodenum where tumors in the tail grow down into the patient's jejunum. So again, when you talk about METS to bowel, I usually mean solitary METS, not direct extension by tumor. Occasionally you get hematogenous spread, and sometimes you see patients with masses, particularly melanoma, years later, and you wonder what's going on. They've been good for 12 years, but there it is, they have melanoma. So that becomes very, very important as well. Now I guess I could say, anybody have any questions? We got some other people signing on, I see, uh, I, don't, I can't read the person's name. I don't want to make a mess of it, but they're in Mongolia. So now, we, and then there's somebody from Michigan, Patricia Hogan. So now we have Michigan and Mongolia, two M's, probably uh, 10,000 miles apart. So 
really seeing a lot of people, but if you have questions, it's really a good time to ask questions. I will tell you that I, I maybe can get you the link, but I am inter interviewing, actually interviewing Patrick Carlson, the CEO and co-founder of Stripe, which is one of the biggest internet companies, privately held. The guy's incredible. He's gonna talk about how he built his company, how he dropped out of MIT twice, and really how he thinks about things, and he's very interested in medicine, and he's interested in change and success. He's all of 32 years of age as of the other day, so it should be a really good conversation, and I've listened to, uh, if you can't make our talk, go on the internet, put in Patrick Colson, his brother's John Colson, you can put his brother in also, fantastic, uh, NPR was a spectacular interview, and many other interviews. He's very, very sharp, very much on the go and on the ball of what's happening and what, what could happen. He's one of those people who you really feel like you like without knowing, and it's one of those people you really feel like the energy of them come across the screen. So I think that will be very, very exciting, and that's five o'clock next Wednesday. So with that, if no one has any questions, I see uh, no one's asking me any questions, that'll be a good summary on the bow. Uh, so, so we've spoken about technique, water and IP contrast, multiplanar, re multiplanar reconstructions, 3D mapping, MIP and volume rendering, and now I'm trying cinematic rendering. Also talking about the importance of dual phase imaging. Also the importance of being very careful when looking at bowel, because things are very easy to miss. One of the easiest misses is small bowel, mesentery, and in the bowel itself. If things are unobstructed, they're often missed. You gotta look very careful. It's a big source of error. So with that, let me just say that uh, I hope everyone has a great day, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye guys, or next week, bye.